So it's a great pleasure this morning to introduce to you Professor Richard Osborne. I'd like to welcome everybody and Richard particularly and thank you very, very much. Um, Richard is a professor in public health and the head of the public health innovation at Deakin University in Australia. And he holds the prestigious National Health and Medical Research Council Senior Research Fellowship uh, between now and 2018. Richard is a highly experienced questionnaire developer, validator and translator. He has given numerous masterclasses on this area and he's led over 60 translation, cultural adaptations and measurement adaptation workshops across the world, I think it would be fair to say. Much of Richard's work has involved the grounded development of questionnaires that have extensive local and international impact. And in the last 10 years, he's become a recognized international leader in two particular areas, one being patient education and the other health literacy. And that's the topic of our, our webinar this morning. So without any further ado, Richard, I hope that was okay as an introduction. I'd like to hand over to you for what I'm sure will be a really interesting webinar. Okay, here we go. Um, Good morning, Good morning, everyone. It's uh, nearing midnight here in Australia. It's great to be talking to you. I'm a night owl, so you don't need to feel sorry for me at all. And I'm, I'd welcome people to interrupt me at any time for questions. And uh, that's certainly part of the deal. No problem at all to interrupt me. I'm just going to even insult me as I go if you wish. No problem. So, a little bit of introduction first. Uh, what is chronic disease self-management? Well, consideration of the individual with a chronic condition, but it's also their family and carers, and, and the healthcare professionals. You'll notice a theme throughout our work here is that we do take great interest in the healthcare professionals and all the people around within the system uh, to support the family and the carers. Chronic disease self-management is involves a holistic approach in acknowledging the medical, the psychosocial and the cultural aspects. And very broadly it aims to empower individuals in their own health and well-being. But there's a very interesting, te interesting tension here. We have empowerment and we have education and we have potential sick roles and indeed we have the opportunity to medicalise people and have them uh, focusing perhaps a little bit too much on, uh, on the medicine rather than the life that one might lead. And we'll come back to that during the presentation. Now, is this working for you? That's the first slide. Is, uh, is it a good volume, a good pace? But there's no microphone here. Yes, there, so. yes, that's fine. Good. I do need to check that someone's still there because it's a little bit disconcerting, just talking to my computer in the middle of the night at my university. Okay, let's keep going. So self-management is support is what we do. It's the facility that health and social care services provide. It's there to enhance patient well-being or person well-being and management of chronic conditions. I focus on self-management and skills training and there's a very wide range of approaches. But there's been quite a focus on formal group-based education programs and I'd very much like to have discussions about all the other kinds of programs that you can have, different formats and the evaluation of those as well. Uh, but and you could think in many ways, we have everything really solved. We really do need to um, work with our healthcare professionals and uh, with their outstanding work. But when you think about it, health professionals are playing a very small part in the whole business because more than 99% of a person's time really is spent by themselves at home and with their care in their family or in a community. And that's where most of the work is done, not at the time of the healthcare professional, but by themselves. So the healthcare professional plays a very powerful role, uh, but the self-care opportunities can potentially play the greatest proportion of contribution to well-being for many groups in society, but not all necessarily. There's various groups in society which we need to focus on and perhaps think about a bit differently. And this is some excellent work done by a senior research fellow in my team here in Australia. 
Roy Batterham was able to interview about 80 separate um, case studies, um, undertake 80 separate case studies, and really see the entire breadth of, you could say, self-management competency. And it becomes very clear that self-management is not just yes or no, you're a good self-manager, you're not. In fact, there are a large number of people who are already very able to set goals and commit to them and take initiative and in assessing the means and, um, and actually able to achieve them. Quite a large number of people, in fact. And then there's a group who are able to set and commit to personal goals, but it requires assistance with arrangements to meet these. They may have periods of significant personal discouragement and require assistance um, to overcome setbacks. And perhaps there's another group who are able to express wishes and preferences and understands how health services and personal actions can contribute to these. They can actively participate in health service decisions and they can cooperate to the best of their ability, but it's piecemeal approach, um, have a piecemeal approach to their personal health care actions. Another group, in fact, has some capacity to express aspirations and wishes and understand health implications and they're willing to participate in health decisions but they're easily swayed off track and they have difficulty maintaining personal effort. And the group here at the end, at the tail, they have very little understanding of what is done to them and no emotional buy-in or commitment. Cooperation is ad hoc and reactive if at all. In fact, some of these people would indeed be comatose in the intensive care unit uh, and they just have stuff done to them and that's absolutely appropriate and people can choose to do that or they uh, have no choice at all, which is quite different to the other end of the, of the pole where we have really health and fitness fanatics where it doesn't really matter what you do to them, they'll do well. So this is a very interesting set of categories where clinicians and many groups around the world um, really relate very strongly to and we need to look after these groups in a different different ways. So the classic self-manager, the highest performing group you could say, they're largely independent and looking after their health and certainly can work with themselves between healthcare episodes. They can look after themselves, they can think about things. They have some regular health improvement activities in their lives. And they can initiate engagement themselves and, and uh, with health and related providers when necessary or when they consider it beneficial. Really, it doesn't matter what you do to them. Classic health education, even one-offs education programs will probably work quite well with many people in this particular group. Then you have supported self-manager. We call this the next group. Um, they're able to set and commit to personal goals but requires assistance and arrangements to meet these. They may have periods of significant personal discouragement and require assistance to overcome setbacks. Now the strategies to support these people are a bit different, a bit more sophisticated. It can be health education, referral, some monitoring will help, coaching is good, linkage to services and relapse planning. So you can see it's getting a bit more sophisticated, a little bit more hands-on. The next group we call the prompted self-manager able to express wishes and preferences and understands how, well, how health services and personal actions can contribute to these, they have some insight and they can actively participate in health service decisions and cooperate to the best of the ability, as I said before, piecemeal. So the strategies are a bit different here. Coaching of course is good. Or they, we need to organise environmental stimuli, reminders around them. We need to assist them to establish routines and to work with their families is another good way. Now further along the normal curve, we have the reactive, reactive cooperator and as a reminder, they have some capacity to express aspirations and wishes and understands health implications. They're willing to participate in health decisions but easily swayed off track and they may have difficulty maintaining personal effort. So some important strategies here include to assist them to establish routines, normal everyday things, get it into their lives in some regular way, or healthy activities or health promotion um, procedures. You do need to try to preempt and address any crises. You have to address mental health conditions and indeed assist families. 
the last group here, in many places and times, they're regarded as as um, too hard, or other programmers that a lot of, that are out there are just just not suitable. The non-cooperator who has very little understanding of, of what is done to them and no emotional buy-in or commitment and very little uh, cooperation. So with these people, um, what we find with the, uh, the most dedicated and uh, committed clinicians, the things that work for, to enable even these most disenfranchised and fragile members of our society got to find at least something they, they love to do absolutely ensure that crisis needs are met, ensure mental health issues are, are treated, assist families or carers, and establish a relationship with one or two care providers, either health or social care providers. Any one of these things can be a key indicator, a key opportunity for a person to engage in their self-care at least a little bit and prevent that downward spiral and to build a little bit of strength, a little bit of competency and confidence for getting back into uh, opportunities for, for to gain health rather than losing it because of their poor health and their social circumstances. If there's any comments about this, um, you're most welcome to raise them. Um, and it's going to be a little hard because I can't see your faces. I can't see whether you're grimacing at me or that uh, you're getting a light bulbs, but I'm going to assume the latter because that will help me keep my energy up. So out of this we could perhaps generate a new definition of self-management based on this experience demonstrated in these case studies that people at all levels of self-management can achieve meaningful improvements in their ability to self-manage. Therefore, a definition may be uh, uh, self-management may be a person's capacity to self-manage is their ability to participate in decisions that affect their health and to continue to implement these decisions between contacts with health services. The key issue here is between contact with health services. That's where the self-management work is going on. As I mentioned before, there's many, many types of self-management programs and here's uh, one such list, but basically it goes from face-to-face uh, -face consultations, telephone coaching, internet courses, uh, group ongoing cycle, rehabilitation. Hi Richard, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Um, we do have a number of people who have questions. Are you okay to take some of them now? Oh, yes, please. Okay, here we go. Matt Rawthorne. Oh, Matt says he has no microphone, unfortunately. So... The question is, is this trans diagnostic? I'm not quite sure what he means by that, Richard. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Matt's question is, is this trans diagnostic? And, and also another question is, how does the definition you've just put forward differ from patient activation. Okay. okay. Um, trans diagnostic, I'm not really familiar with that term, but uh, I expect is it, um, is this generic? Is this across all kinds of chronic conditions? Certainly this work was done across many different kinds of chronic conditions, including um, experience with head injury to uh, common chronic conditions like diabetes and arthritis and cardiovascular conditions. So indeed it's designed to be quite generic. Has, has, it also yeah, has it also covered across mental health as well, Richard? Uh, very much so. And Roy has uh, great experience in the whole area. When I'm, when I'm talking, we'll have to put the microphone um, um, in a different place, so that the feedback is extraordinary. This definition, um, how does it fit with uh, patient activation? Uh, I'm not super experienced with patient activation concept, although I have uh, seen um, the PAM and other similar questionnaires. But what's important here is that we're carefully considering um, in full, the people who are most disadvantaged in the communities who might classically be 
um, regarded as uh, not ready or unable to engage in self-management and a lot of programs not being suitable for Okay, Richard, we have a couple of other questions. Kenneth Lee has a question. Kenneth, would you like to put your question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can, can hear you. Oh. oh, yeah, my question was the one that was just answered. So um, how does the new definition of self-management differ from patient activation? The addition there is that um, we're really seeking to uh, understand the full breadth of self-management competencies or capabilities, so the definition needs to be uh, very full embracing. And what you'll see now is uh, some various operationalization of this definition and the patients or the uh, consumers' perspective about their uh, what they would hope to experience from an outstanding set of management course. There's a question in the room. Yes, looking, looking at what you put up, it's a, I'm, I'm picking the phrase you started with, self-management support is what we do, are you restricting yourself entirely to things that actually we as professionals or practitioners or volunteers that do to people? In, in England, increasingly, we're thinking about peer-to-peer -peer support, things that go on actually in the community that might not even involve professionals or, 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 or even specific volunteers, and particularly in those that are um, less engaged or activated or whatever we're going to call them, um, it's perhaps those sorts of interventions that might be most supportive. And although I know your philosophy is not to do things to people, looking at the things you went down, they were all things we were doing to people, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, you're certainly right. A lot of this is what we have to set up around people, but indeed um, peers can be outstanding at health education, outstanding at coaching. Uh, so what needs to be in place for uh, particularly uh, vulnerable people is uh, the entire environment. So the family members can support them in self-management as their friends and peers uh, and all that. So I think um, a lot of these can be classified or be seen as what the system can do to people, but it's certainly very much these activities have to be about uh, um, the entire environment that a person is in. Fine, um, thank you. Okay, so thinking more about uh, the complexity, to the left of this diagram here, but the more complex People need more assistance, more monitoring, and have small goals, small manageable goals. And then at this end here where we're complex, we've got to really provide people with a lot more know-how support. How do I do manage my diabetes? What is, it, what is this information about blood and numbers? A lot of know-how about procedures. And then over here, if it's complex, it's certain know what to do support. And there's a lovely phrase from a lot of uh, uh, some of the peer, peer support that you, you learn from, you get to hear from the healthcare system uh, what to do, and then from peers, it's no, it's no how to do that. In many ways, at this end, people may have lower health literacy, at this end, higher health literacy. So I'm beginning to introduce this term of health literacy. So indeed, what is chronic so disease self-management, how should it be measured, a key topic here today. And putting it out to you, it's going to be hard in this sort of format, but um, if someone did a really good self-management training course, what would it look like? And in the workshop setting or face-to-face, -face, we can get people to just shout very quickly to tell us what's their personal experience um, and get what's the view of the person managing their own chronic condition. Okay, so I'll carry on. Um, here are some um, some key elements of effective models of self-management. It's not a complete list, and um, in wide variety of workshops that people had uh, suggested, and um, there's no correct or full, entirely full list. It does really depend on the individual and their environment, their family options, um, the particular uh, social norms that a person comes from very wide range of uh, perspectives. 
but when we come to develop a questionnaire, we use the same process. Um, we know we have an important problem out there to manage. A grounded consultation is where you, you put theory behind. And let's actually not put theory uh, in our minds uh, and risk having blinkers on. Let's go and talk to real people about their experiences. Then you can develop independent constructs or specific ideas around what is emerging from the community you're seeking to serve. Then you can write items and questionnaire items and do cognitive testing just to check whether people really understand the questions as intended. And then you can do very fancy statistical analyses, confirmatory analysis primarily. And then um, you do a further statistical processes to confirm in the actual group where you intend to apply your questionnaire. But we really feel very strongly if you get this part of your work wrong, the conceptualization, everything else will be wrong. So we're very keen to go to the hearts and minds of people in the community for them to guide us on what to measure. And we use a process called concept mapping, which is a very structured process, a very comfortable process for even the most vulnerable people, um, as well as practitioners and policymakers. You'll have to excuse me, security's come to see what's going on down here, so there's going to be a bit of noise in the background. Um, it starts with a brainstorming activity where the seeding statement we use was thinking as broadly as possible. What would you want people who'd done a self-management course to say they got out of it? And we asked this of people who had um, from a very wide range of courses and wide range of demographics to tell us what they thought, just as brainstorming activity. Then we asked, we put them onto cards, um, we print them onto cards, and they do the sorting activity. They group them. And then we do a wide range of analyses and we work with people in front of us then and there, uh, consumers and policy makers and practitioners to interpret the maps. Generally, uh, the maps that we, gener we generate uh, from uh, consumer groups or patient groups are far more detailed and far more interesting and in providing new insight than practitioners and policy makers. Why is that? Well, our practitioners and particularly policy makers generally have the rhetoric of the day and that's what they present because that's what they need to do, whereas we're from patients and um, consumers and their carers, they're able to present what's their lived experience today. And this is the origins of, the, of um, these eight groupings, which come from the hearts and minds of people who are struggling with chronic conditions and had done um, one or more sub-management courses. They thought that if you had a after doing a course, if you had a positive and active engagement life, that would be a good outcome from a course. We had health directed activities. We had new skills and techniques. We had constructive attitudes and approaches to things. We had self monitoring and insight. We could navigate the healthcare system. And you had better social integration and support. And that you had less emotional distress. So the guidance from our community helped us develop the health education impact questionnaire, and that's important part of the origins of it. We were able to publish this in Patient Education and Counselling in 2007 in a very rigorously done um, study where um, I love this part of my presentation because I get to present this very fancy diagram. And when the diagram came through and these numbers here came through in 2006 when we were about to publish it, I just about cried. And the reason for that, that we have eight very separate ideas that come from the hearts and minds of people, but statistically they're all very different. Now the, I was doing this work for the Commonwealth Government and in partnership with um, the Arthritis Foundations across the country, and they said they wanted a short questionnaire, but then everyone said these are things they wanted to measure. So it ends up being a long questionnaire, it ends up being 40 questions, and it's very hard to have separate dimensions in these settings. In the end, we have actually eight very separate questionnaires telling us eight very separate things about the people in our community. And since the initial time it's been published, it's been reproduced in this same format in France and Germany, Denmark, Canada, and Netherlands, and several other countries doing this kind of rigorous analysis to test it against different other uh, questionnaires and different other um, tools and cross diseases in different cultures as well. It's mostly reproduced even in Japan. That should have been on the list here too. Um, we were very keen to develop a tool that served not just 
um, the consumer. The consumer is our name for patients or citizens in Australia. Uh, to serve um, patients, to serve practitioners and to serve organisations. So we partnered with a very large number of organisations around the country and got a large sample from uh, many um, courses. What we're seeking to do is understand what happens before and after people taking part in a course. Here's the positive and active engagement in life scale. What we have here is a graph of post-course minus pre-course. It's the change score. So here, this is zero, so this is a group of people who had no change before and after in this particular, quest, this particular scale. But we have a group, and here's a statistical level, which is over here. We think this change here is more than statistical difference or it's more than chance could suggest. So it's actually, we kind of classify this as a substantial change. Because if I present to you, oh, for your group, your change was 3.447, you would say, so what, Richard? Um, you've told me nothing that I can understand and can use. But if I told you 36% of people had a change between before and after that was really was substantial. And we developed this method in consultation with uh, um, people running courses across the communities and uh, EPP-like programs. And so that was a far more powerful way to communicate what was going on. And here's the eight scales down here. And we can see with this particular group, this is the percentage change. 36% uh, of people with positive active engagement life, 48, nearly half had improvements in health direct directed behaviour and so on. So this is a particularly strong course, had big improvements for a lot of people. Now that we've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of course reports, we can call them, we now have a very clear idea of when a course is good or when is a course is actually not necessarily performing well. But there's more to this than just the change score. About a third, we can say, of participants under these kind of conditions with each of these measures are suggesting that the course is uh, impacting on about a third of people in a good way. Not a third of people, yeah, about a third of people. <coughs> a two. Here is, sorry, it's on a bit of an angle. This is a tool that's used in some settings. We have down here uh, the actual scale name, the eight scale names, emotional well-being or distress, it's scored in a negative direction, so this is why it's shaded like that. And we have very user-friendly terms, doing things to stay fit and healthy to represent health-directed um, behaviour, keeping on enjoying life for positive active engagement life, really user-friendly concepts that capture the dimension name. At this end of the scale we have an unhappy face for the negative scale, uh, for the positive scales and a happy face for the negative scale. So these are population norms. So if a person comes in and we can do a test on them or a whole group and we see, have a score here for a particular person, we can say, oh, Mrs. Jones, you seem to be struggling with um, doing things to stay fit and healthy. Tell us about that. Um, how can we help you? But also here we might find a, there might be a score here about um, skills to help me live with my illness. We might see a strong score here. Oh, Mrs. Jones, terrific, I see you've got great strengths in here, tell us about that. So it's an opportunity to profile a person's self-management skills or competencies across a wide range and understand their strengths and weaknesses so that we can understand how best to help them. But of course, pre-post an intervention, we can see what elements they're improving on uh, and link this back to the quality of the course, the quality of the, um, the trainers, and um, then think through how can we deliver for those people that we need to serve. So it's part of the initial vision for developing the HiQ was for it to be a quality and monitoring tool. What we sought to do um, is develop a bunch of questions that weren't smile questions, that they uh, which you can't really take any action on. So this is a course delivery report, uh, course delivery quality report form and I'm not too sure you can read it on your screen. The first one says, I intend to tell other people that the program is very worthwhile. The next one, the program has helped me set goals that are reasonable within reach. And now this is my favourite question. I trust the information and advice I was given in the program. Wow, 
as someone delivering a program, either a, a trainer or a course leader or a manager, if you have even one or two people across a range of courses that are, are marking anywhere really below slightly agree, that's a bit of a red flag. You'd really want everyone to be trusting what's going on. So these questions are written not as the typical patient satisfaction question is, uh, smile sheets, but to provide very pertinent information about course quality for which you again can take action to improve the program potentially. But the dimensions is where it's most interesting. What we'll also like to do is present what was the score of people coming into your course? If we find that a course is not producing very high results, it could be that the course is not effective. But it could mean that people were coming in at a high level for a start, so they actually had nowhere to go, no improvement left in, in them. So you could say, well, if they're coming in high, then we're not expecting to see um, high changes necessarily. But in fact, with this constructive attitudes and approaches, that's incorrect there, we still had a third of people having a big improvement out of tw um, eight out of 22 people having quite a substantial improvement, which is terrific. So it's important to know who the people are because the in baseline information compared with your population norms can tell you your targeting. How good are you? Are you really going out to the people who are, are who are, um, have the capacity to benefit, or are you going out to dragging people off the street who perhaps um, are already doing quite well and may not um, be the, the target population intended? Okay. And thinking about uh, the quality monitoring approach, down the bottom here we have the participants and courses. We might have a wide variety of organisations providing courses. We might have states or provinces or uh, regions or jurisdictions and then perhaps the top organisation. So in many ways um, I built this tool because I could see tremendous frustration out there. Uh, in, the, in the hospital where I started this, um, Kate Loriger being uh, working and developed a, uh, a national survey with the regional arthritis self-management course. We evaluate it using traditional tools and a lot of the tools are saying, well, there's no effect of this program. But I could hear something was going on, the amount of noise coming out of the seminar room with uh, patients with um, in waiting for joint replacement and other very severe musculoskeletal conditions. Something was happening there and nurses coming up to me who are running the courses. And these questionnaires aren't really showing what's going on, really what's going on. Of course, as an epidemiologist back then, I think, well, these course, these uh, trainers are really just trying to justify uh, what's going on so they keep their jobs and keep their fun program. Uh, but it really did spur us on to look into what really are the outcomes for individuals so that we can perhaps uh, support uh, groups doing a really good job so they can communicate what they're doing to their funders. But at the same time, I was working with the Commonwealth Government and other organisations about evaluation as an evaluator. The funders are very frustrated because they were putting all this money out and couldn't see any particular benefits. And the people running courses were frustrated because they couldn't communicate. They wanted to go to the government, we're doing a great job to the funders, we're doing a great job. Can you provide us more money? And the funders say, well, we can't do that because we can't really see um, the benefits you're delivering. So the high cue was to develop to try to fill that need. And indeed, what we experienced was that uh, course leaders and organisations would be ringing my research unit and saying, where's our course report? We want to know about it. We want to see how we've done this time. Because people finding there's great meaningfulness between the eight dimensions that change course and what they can see, it got a bit spooky at some Sometimes where I would actually, uh, I, before hearing anything about the course, I would describe to the course leader or the manager, this is what I think has happened in your course. Because I could see different patterns of uh, strengths and weaknesses and benefits across the course quality um, report and the course report. Very interesting that it was because the tool comes from the hearts and minds of people in the community and we're always faithful to that. And this is represented in the final dimensions and the scores we're actually able to get and understand. And it's used in many, many interesting places now, which is terrific. Um, so I'm going to have one more slide and then we're going to have a bit of a, a question time. No, actually, no, let's have a little bit of questions now, if you like.
Kathy's asking if the um, lack of being able to see the results are due to the small effect sizes no, the fact that, oh, sorry. That, um, in evaluations, the effect size is not always calculated into evaluations. Right. It, yes. So it's about the effect sizes not always being calculated into the evaluations. I think that's right and in some courses you'll have a mix of people who are already performing quite well and some people who are not and it might be just the 5 or 10 or 15 percent of people who have miraculous clinical or life-changing experiences and a lot of the evaluation tools and analyst processes won't see that. What I was concerned about is we have these people down here having enormous change, absolutely enormous. We need to be able to see that. So indeed, so a lot of courses do not have a very big effect size for that reason, that only a few people are having big changes, a lot of people potentially already doing quite well, so they can't change very much. But also a lot of evaluation tools aren't necessarily evaluating the hidden impacts of a course. Um, in arthritis, they're often measuring pain and disability. But what's really happening in a lot of the courses is that we're trying to enable people to have a life despite their chronic disease. What the high care measures is a lot of these uh, immediate impacts and important things for people's lives, which are much more sensitive to the changes, or the intended changes, or intended impacts of the course. Thanks, Richard. I think, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, I think there's at least a couple of more questions. I'm going to try again, see if I can see. Sandra, would you like to put your question, please? Um, well, I've sent it. I, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Um, well, I don't work for any health organisation. I'm um, a member of the public that becomes involved in research. We have a massive movement to do with that in the UK. But um, I, I, I have lived with a chronic disabling condition all my life, something called years. What I want to know, my question is that to me, my question is, generalist literacy rate, are they considered? Because part of empowering them um, to, to better health is being able to read what people are writing about it. So, you know, you have, in our country, I think it's still about one in six of the adult population doesn't read at a working level. So are, are those things considered when you're... Um, actually, um, this slide here, I began to see many countries who were evaluating some management courses, and I can see that uh, oftentimes uh, it was quite with mass media advertising to bring people in in the UK and Denmark uh, and now. Uh, Israel and a few other in Australia, uh, people were coming into these courses who are already quite literate and quite well educated uh, and, the, and, got, and uh, reasonably quickly over a year or two, three years, uh, a lot of those people who already um, had chronic conditions who were taking part in what the course was being offered. Um, what, what we'll what my frustration began to be is that potentially self-measuring courses were promoted by governments for inducing social inequalities in health because it was the, the more able people yes, able to take their part and not the disabled people or, or disempowered. I mean. This led us into the field of health literacy and I think we can engage in a conversation shortly uh, after going through the, um, how we went about developing the health literacy question and what results that's delivering for us now. Can we, can we come back to you? Yes. Great. Okay. Richard, do you want to carry on and we'll take more questions a bit later? Okay, doke. So we began to think about self-care and self-management. So what we might try to imagine is some sort of self-management or community utopia where everyone had command and empowerment over the healthcare system, over the treatments they needed and their care providers, that they had access to opportunities to engage in healthy activities, 
they had the confidence to take initiative whenever they wanted and they had supportive environments that really enabled them to engage in and maintain healthy behaviours but unfortunately a lot of people don't have that. They don't actually have the capacity to identify or even recognise there's a health message in front of them nor do they have the capacity to understand health information. They don't have access to information about health and healthcare professionals. They don't have the, f the faculties to distinguish incorrect or useful information from incorrect or unimportant information. Then you might say there's the fancy scales from the high Q, all these great skills and competencies. And above that perhaps there's action planning and problem solving and then perhaps to self-management utopia. I say that in a jokingly way, but I just want to really highlight that there's a big group down here who have who will struggle and it, it is to do with the literacy levels as from the question before, but also to how tough it is to have a chronic condition and get by and try to have a life despite your chronic condition. And this really led us to the field of health literacy. Now health literacy has been defined in many ways and I'm not generally engaging in the health literacy definition wars as one of my colleagues calls, called them. But health literacy's general definition, it's got something about obtaining, processing and understanding basic health information. Obtain, use, um, it's skills to really enable a person to be able to use the system. The definition that we use the most is a, a really quite a broad one. Um, health literacy represents, this is from the WHO, Health literacy represents the cognitive and social skills which determine the motivation and ability of individuals to gain access to, access to understand and use information in ways which promote and maintain good health. There's been quite a lot of research that's been done on health literacy and there's been mostly association studies or correlation studies where low knowledge and poor health have been associated with low health literacy levels. Low health literacy has been linked to inadequate knowledge about health in the healthcare system, increased hospitalisation, and poor access and utilisation of health services. And people with lower health literacy levels are up to three times more likely to experience a poor health event. But a lot of these have been based on really quite blunt measures of health literacy, really focusing on the reading ability and numeracy. How has health literacy been measured? I need to show you that so you can get a better sense of what I'm talking about. There's been three main tools that kind of test patients and it comes from a lot of the education traditions in the US. A tool called the Rapid Estimate of Adult Literacy in Medicine, the Realm, the Test of Functional Health Literacy in Adults, the TOFLA, and the newest vital sign are the tools in the past that have been used the most. But there's a major problem here that we can see very early, very early on, that if you could not read, you could not be tested and therefore you had a score of zero. But being illiterate or un unable to read or the test wasn't in braille, it doesn't mean that you have zero health literacy. This began to bother us quite a lot. So we tried to have a more of an inclusive framework for all the little, all the particular elements of health literacy. And this is really after a person has the basics, that there's absence of catastrophic health problems, absence of poverty and safety. They have their mental health. So a person needs to have the language of the country or of the health system where they are. They need to be able to communicate in some way. Vocabulary, they need to be able to know which words are being used and indeed what these words mean and the implications of these words. Then there's a whole bunch of health competencies, skills, abilities and the reading and writing. And then above that perhaps there's empowerment or agency. Um, there are a variety of definitions of agency but we see this as a person's, is it okay to ask a question of a healthcare professional? Is it okay for me to seek help from someone else in the family even? It's just the sense of it's okay, I have permission within society to have a chance of health. Around these are a whole range of supportive and determining structures we call them. You know, trust and faith, emotional well-being, cultural um, well-being or, or cultural permission to engage in health and environmental determinants. So we're quite inclusive here. Um, 
are really quite keen to acknowledge that there are reading and writing like a lot of the tests that come from mainly in the US, but there's all these other things which are very important which are embodied in those full quest in those full definitions I just mentioned. I just want to show you what the tests have been because most of the research you'll read about uh, will be using these questionnaires. The realm is a list of three increasingly different um, words and a person is asked to pronounce them. If they pronounce them quickly, uh, correctly, they get a mark towards their health literacy even if they don't understand what the word means. So this is um, generally not recommended to be used at all anymore. The test of functional health literacy in adults, here we have a medication label and a person is asked to read this and then fill in this question. If you take your first tablet at 7am, when should you take the next one and the next one after that? I'm actually just a bit dyslexic and I find these questions terrifying. Also the newest vital sign, here is an ice cream label and the person is read various questions, here's one of the questions, if you eat the entire container, how many calories will you eat? And some of you may have got it already, it takes me a long time to get these, so a thousand. Sometimes people answer, I don't eat ice cream, which is a score of zero, which is not really related to their health literacy. And it's, a lot of these were designed for short tests, or this one was designed for short tests in the clinical setting, and not really intended to capture empowerment. You could say that these three tools are, are capturing functional health literacy, mainly about the reading and writing. Um, we use these tools and some other tools in a population survey in Australia and we got these results. We found that with the realm we had about 13% of people who had low health literacy according to this tool. And the classification is based on um, linkage to national surveys of literacy about health, uh, classic literacy surveys in the US from some years ago. The TOFLA is called the same way, it suggested about 7% of people had uh, low health literacy and for the NBS, the ice cream level one, uh, it was suggesting that uh, about 26% of people had low health literacy. But then around the same time we had a national survey of adult learning which made a very big and dramatic statement that 60% of Australians have low health literacy which is a bit worse than in Canada and um, I think a bit worse than the US. So here we are, we've got somewhere between 7% and 60% of people with low health literacy. My goodness, what is going on? Well, the classification here of 60% is based on um, confidential algorithms. The even Australian government never was allowed to see these algorithms. And in fact, it's reflected back to literacy surveys in the US. Uh, so I don't think this tells us much at all, other than, oh, there might be a problem out there no linkage to health outcomes or what to do about the problem. So to make ourselves a little bit unpopular, I guess, we just did a very straightforward critical appraisal of the health literacy tools out there. We really did fi find that most of the tools really fail to meet fundamental measurement criteria and in fact they weren't really measuring very much of the definition at all. The definition wasn't matching what they intended to measure or said to measure. And this led us on to um, trying to develop new tools as at the same time we're happening in Europe. With um, So what I'll present today mostly is about the health literacy questionnaire uh, built for Western cultures and uh, we're about to release for Eastern cultures, uh, a whole big enormous ground of development um, project with uh, enormous numbers of people including people who are blind and deaf with, uh, and physical disabilities, large numbers of them from Thailand. And in Europe, um, I was part of the team here, we developed, it was led by um, University of Maastricht in the eight country project, the HLS EU, uh, to design to measure populations and inform policy. I could mention a little bit about uh, work with children and uh, a little bit of upcoming work about e-health literacy if there is time. Um, so here's a bit of a time we could stop and have questions if you wish before I go on to describe the health literacy questionnaire. 
We have a question in the room, Richard. Uh, the health literacy questionnaire uh, for developing countries, is it the same as the one for the Western or has it been adapted? No, it's completely redone from a grounded approach and has um, uh, some overlap, but there's many different things in there uh, because we're very concerned that we shouldn't attempt to apply a Western concept because health is dealt with in, in many different ways at the village, um, at the village level, um, including issues around family decision making about health. At times, the family leader will go with the person with a problem for when it's serious to make decisions. Uh, there's a whole, ish, whole uh, culture around trial and error, uh, much more engagement with uh, traditional medicine, um, and there's very different ways of dealing with psychological stress. Um, and so it, it really, these are the things that we found were quite different. And uh, if we have time, I'm able to dig them up and show you them as well later on. But no, it's very different. But also, what we with uh, Thai, we work with the Thailand government with this over two years to develop, uh, and they have a very very strong policy of equity, and our consultations included um, really hundreds of people who are blind, and hundreds of people who are deaf, and hundreds of people with a range of physical disabilities, and we work directly with uh, community leaders and with people in their own homes across the country to ensure that the health literacy tool is going to fit with their vocabulary because each of these groups have different ways of describing their own worlds with their uh, different languages. Um, uh, so we've, we've insisted the tool is equitable and fair across all these groups. Any other questions? Okay, we have a follow-up question uh, to ask if uh, the, the adapted ones for developing countries are still based on the eight original questions. Or the eight domains in the in the hiking. No. We actually, uh, it's not adapted and it's not uh, changed. It's done completely for first principles again, and it has more dimensions. Uh, it's got separate dimensions relevant to people with uh, physical disabilities or chronic conditions, and um, uh, um, uh, we ask people in the village in their own language, um, sitting in their own environment, uh, what you need to be able to understand, access and engage with uh, the health care opportunities around you for yourself and your family. And they came up with a different set of questions. So after I go through the English version that's used uh, very widely now, I can come back at the end of it and take you through the differences there. But I kind of need to go through the health literacy questionnaire first before we can see the contrast. It may well be that the that the questionnaire we developed in Thailand for the Eastern world uh, may be more suitable in more settings than uh, what we uh, than than the, the questionnaire we developed in Australia. Thanks, Richard. We're just going to take one more question from Anya. Anya, I can't see the question that you've typed, so I'm going to unmute you just now. And if you could please put your question to Richard. Hello, hi. We had a question from um, Matt via Twitter, which was, um, what's the relationship um, between self-management and recovery and mental health? Um, recovery and mental health, um, self-management is absolutely critical. Um, and with the early part of the presentation, we talked about um, being able to do little steps in self-management, having little tasks, uh, little goals, and building confidence and strength incrementally. A really sophisticated approach to supporting a person in their self-management, whether it's about taking, um, building exercise uh, and social engagement and small steps in working with healthcare professionals. Self-management is absolutely fundamental. Um, I, I think it's uh, uh, without a sophisticated support, uh, a lot of people um, are going to really struggle, and they do struggle. But it is, and it it is quite inspiring how a lot of people do um, adapt and decide and are empowered either by themselves or by the family or or peers to begin to develop the strength and the skills to get back into life. 
and either overcome and fool their mental health problems or they're able to live with them and enable and still have empowered enabled life despite their their mental health conditions okay so um i think we should press on richard okay okay so in developing the health literacy questionnaire we spent a lot of time thinking about the purpose and conceptualization I won't go through this list in detail, but we have quite a, a rigorous process and we developed um, really quite a lot of questionnaires. And we take this very seriously because uh, my work in influenza, uh, so the questionnaire to measure the effectiveness of, of vaccines or, or new drugs, uh, where effectively billion dollars, billion dollar decisions are being made uh, using the results from the questionnaire I developed means that you've got to get it right whether it's about a pharmaceutical company, which is one field, or it's a questionnaire designed to inform a person or their carers or their practitioners about their, um, their health literacy competency, it still is enormous responsibility that we have as a questionnaire developer to make sure that the questions are understood as intended, the concepts are really meaningful to a person's life, and that the questions give a voice to a person in a way that informs the people around them. So there's, if you've got to get the purpose and conceptualization right, and uh, we spent an enormous amount on that, because if you get that wrong, of course, everything else is wrong after that. That of um, Soren Kierkegaard is a Danish philosopher. If one, is to, if one is truly to succeed in leading a person to a specific place, one must first and foremost take care to find him or her where he or she is and begin there. And that's generally uh, a great theme in all our work. So to find out what's going on for people in the community, we understood, we undertook um, concept mapping workshops from 2006 to 2012 and analysing these in people who had done chronic, uh, chronic disease self-management courses, people in the general population, and people who, so, so between 2006 and 2012, we produced a questionnaire called the Helms. But when we went to uh, the community and to users, uh, we decided it just wasn't good enough. So we had to start again. It wasn't good enough because it wasn't really reaching clearly enough into people who were doing okay and people doing well with their health literacy. And we had lost some of the early ideas. We weren't really getting the clear voice of the people from initially consulted. So this is what we ask people in the community. Thinking about your experiences in trying to look after your health or the health of your family, what abilities does a person need to have in order to get and use all the information they need? This is done in a very comfortable workshop and um, enabling people to think freely of their own ideas in their own lives, to reflect on their lived experience. And this formed the dimensions of the health literacy questionnaire. So again, we're not using any particular theory or any particular prior approach. We're going to the hearts and minds of the community to d decide what we need to measure. We published this um, only, actually only um, seven months ago, and uh, we have 100 groups using it around the world and tweeted to 150,000 people. There's, uh, 12,000 downloads of this article. It's very exciting how uh, it's been filling a needed gap out there across various many, many different settings and purposes. But this is what people come up with. These are the nine scales of the Health Literacy Questionnaire, HLQ as I'll call it now and again. It's got two sets of scales. It's got a strongly agree set of, uh, an agree, disagree set of scales, and then it cannot do very easy set of scales. What I'd like to do is I'll go through these one by one and I'll give you one or two example items from the questionnaire so you can actually see what's being asked of people. The first dimension, number one, feeling understood and supported by healthcare providers. I can rely on at least one healthcare provider as one of the questions. Number two, having sufficient information to manage my health. I'm sure I have all the information I need to manage my health effectively. So it's quite interesting here already. So some of these questions are really reflecting, these dimensions reflecting 
a person's experience of the healthcare system or they're reflecting their own skills, their sense of their competency. This next one here, number three, actively managing my health, an example item being I spend quite a lot of time actively managing my health. That's a very personal and directed thing about an individual. Whereas having sufficient information, number two, is reflecting the quality environment in which they're trying to look after themselves, as is number one, feeling understood and supported by healthcare providers. The fourth one, social support for health, quite straightforward. I have at least one person who can come to medical appointments with me. Number five, appraisal of health information. When I see new information about health, I check up on whether it's true or not, or I compare health information from different sources. Again, a more focused on the individual's um, abilities. Going across to the cannot do at the very easy scale, number six, ability to actively engage with healthcare providers. First question being whether you, your difficulty or how easy it is to discuss things with healthcare providers until you understand all you need to. Number seven, navigating the healthcare system, which is work out what is the best care for you or decide what healthcare providers you need to see. And number eight, ability to find good health information. Get health information in the words you understand or find information about health problems. And the last one, number nine, understand health information well enough to know what to do. Read and understand all information on medication labels and understand healthcare providers, what healthcare providers are asking you to do. Each of the scales have four to five items and they cover eight or nine very separate aspects of a person's life in trying to understand access engaged in healthcare. Oh, this is a good spot to take some questions too. About number six, um, Anthony cannot do stroke very easy. Um, and the question is about uh, when it comes to the ability to actively engage with healthcare providers, does that actually reflect on whether it's the person's own ability to be able to um, engage with the healthcare provider or is it something also about how the healthcare providers interact with the person? Well, <clears throat> there's no way we can separate those two ideas. Uh, so these, this question, these questions come from uh, words that people said in, in the workshops um, with um, patients. So what it does, it can reflect both. So I'll just go to the next slide. So these, all these items, they reflect a citizen's health literacy needs, but also the organisational health literacy responsiveness. So you could say if a person has low health literacy or low ability to engage with healthcare providers, but they're working with wonderful healthcare providers who really make it really very easy for them to discuss all they need to. Alternatively, a person could have quite high health literacy, high competence and great experience, but they have healthcare professionals who uh, really have no time, no interest, and have very little training in, in, in um, uh, in communication. Um, that could be possible. I'm sure it doesn't happen very often in the UK, but it happens here. Um, so you see it does in fact reflect both the, um, the person's competency, but actually it's the competency of the healthcare system as well. So each of these dimensions reflect different proportions or different amounts of those two issues. Okay. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Yes, that has. And also, we were all laughing at the idea that we don't have any problems with healthcare professionals uh, sort of all being able to take on board what, what we're asking for as patients. Okay, so I'm just going to see who else is asking a question or wants to ask a question. If you just bear with me one second. Okay, so um, Jamie Ellis, um, I'm going to unmute you if you'd like to put your question, please. Hello, can you hear us, Jamie? 
No, it's, um, okay, so I'll take somebody else's question. Um, I'm going to go back to Anya because um, Anya might well have another tweet from somebody. Hi, Anya. Can you hear me? Hello, hi. 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 Yes, you can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, do you have another question from someone? Yeah, we've got another question from Twitter, which is um, about the patient activation measure. It seems to focus on um, a patient's state or their trait. Um, and just wondering whether this definition is less likely to stigmatize non-activated people. Um, I think that there would be a risk of that. Um, we're very sensitive to that. In fact, this area of health literacy, and I don't even like the term health literacy, because that has an opportunity to stigmatize people. Um, what I'm interested in is really um, going further into um, self-management and my frustrations in evaluating those programs and seeing that there's many more people we could engage more deeply in self-management and therefore we developed uh, the health literacy questionnaire really to understand people's needs. So I'm more interested in these nine things which people have told us which is what they need to be able to get, uh, need to be able to do or, or have done for them to be able to understand access and engage in healthcare. Patient activation does kind of imply that the, the blame is on on the patient if something is going wrong because they're a bad person because they're not being activated. It does imply that and I don't know whether um, uh, I've never used it and um, uh, so it, it needs to be considered very carefully how the data are going to be used and for what purpose. These, in developing a questionnaire, and this is a, a little bit technical, but these uh, the lived experience from people in the community across each of these dimensions. We're seeking to understand the mechanisms by which enable people to be empowered or enable them to have a chance of engaging with the healthcare system. That's different. Each of these four or five items, the scales, are the, each of the items are tapping into the same mechanism within the constructs in each of these dimensions. So then we have clear information of what to do. So um, I guess I've answered your question, but then gone on to another part of the, um, the topic or the idea. Hi, Richard. Just to say we've got about 10 minutes left now. Okay. <clears throat> so I'll just quickly go through some of the ideas that we've got in here about um, the quality of the tool or what's intended to, to measure. So we're very interested in breadth and depth. So we've carefully written all the items to link in with Bloom's hierarchy, which is, um, in education terms, edu Bloom's hierarchy is uh, it's a structured way of understanding whether the person has information or they can make decisions about things. Also, it's to, it relates to um, how difficult or an easier a question might be to answer. So in one individual, they might read this question here, find information about health problems, oh that's quite easy. But the same person will may find health information from several different places, you know, very difficult to do because they only know one, they can't do this. So they might answer that very differently. So within a scale, when you've got very carefully crafted items across the levels of difficulty, here is the hard one of the hardest items in the scale about ability to find good information find health information in several different places. This is the easiest item, find information from several about health problems. We, we cover a wide range of difficulties and the importance of this, uh, that's the scale in full, um, is that we're seeking to be able to measure health literacy from someone who has really no idea at all to have a little bit of an idea which is great. We need a sensitive scale at that end. But also someone who's really quite strong and clear become really, really clear. So within each scale, a technical process to ensure that we can really fine-grained detect differences and changes and, uh, and movements in, the, in people's uh, abilities or the improvement in the healthcare system around them because these scales do measure both, not just the person's competencies, but reflection of the responsiveness of the organization and the practitioners around them. 
So we could have an exercise here, but I'm going to answer these questions for you. Is there such thing as high and low health literacy? Is health literacy a characteristic of citizens that we need to fix? To improve health literacy, what do we need to do that will work? Well, the first question, is there such thing as high and low health literacy? Well, yes and no. Some people have weaknesses and strengths. Some people, um, well, my mother was um, not too good on the whole health area, but um, I'm her son, and so when she went to the big hospitals and went to the doctors, I was able to go with her. So effectively, she had very high health literacy because I really spent a lot of time looking after her. So people migrants to other countries. They may have children who speak their local languages, so they, in fact they may have high health literacy because their son may be a doctor. And people can have very different levels of high and low health literacy across those nine scales I've just showed you. The next question, is health literacy a characteristic of citizens that we need to fix? Well, possibly, but it's also a characteristic of the responsiveness of the organisation. Indeed, this has come up already. So our work, a lot of it is around ensuring that the environment in which people are, uh, are living, it's as health literacy responsive as possible. And to improve health literacy, what do we need to do to work? Well, health literacy, there's nothing really new in any of these dimensions, nothing really new in any of these ideas. The tool really enables us to measure them now in a very fine-grained way. But the responses is what's happening out there with our best practitioners now, the skills to cope with having unable to read or having a low social network. People have amazing range of solutions already. So what we're interested in is finding local solutions, which is what practitioners and people are doing in the community already to overcome the challenges of low health literacy. As I showed you before, we have different scales for understanding a person's health literacy. So here's a, a, a mock-up of a person's score. Here's the population norm. This particular person scored quite a distance here from the population norm, so they're a bit low on the feeling understood and supported by healthcare providers. And you can see quite different patterns. This person overall has low health literacy. They have about the population norm here for understanding health information well enough to know what to do. But their biggest problem is deciding what information they should trust from the appraisal of health information scale. So a profile information to help us understand the impact of a program on these elements and to guide us on what to do. Here's another example. So indeed I've talked about a person needs to have the basics and health literacy is something which can support a person to make healthy choices to enable them to be informed and enabled. So it's the health literacy organisations who do that and also the health literacy of the individuals that can enable a person to have, a, have healthy choices available to them. Um, so the HLQ indeed measures all these across the different scales in various ways, an earlier framework. I was going to ask these questions now, but um, in the last five minutes, I think um, I might leave this for people to work offline. So what's the link between health literacy and access? There's a big link. Health literacy and the intervention you're providing or wish to provide, so guidance for health, for health for intervention development, course development, um, whether the intervention works or not, the concordance or adherence to treatment. We're seeing quite a few groups now using the HLQ to understand why or why people don't take part in programs so they can redesign the program so that it's more inclusive of people in our community. And of course the HLQ has a whole range of mechanisms in there to inform people why an intervention did or didn't work. So a moderator in a technical term perspective. I'm very keen to tell you a little about about our program here um, in Victoria and how we're using this tool to develop the Victorian Health Literacy Response Framework. We're working with the government and another university and three areas of government, home and community care, primary health and uh, hospital admissions risk program for the frequent flyers, some of the most disadvantaged people in our community. Um, 
what we're doing is that we're really working very close with local stakeholders to identify local priorities. The HLQ is administered to very ordinary people coming into service on a daily basis. Then we're working with the practitioners with the profile from the HLQ from their own patients to work out what a great practitioner is doing now in their daily activities. Then, we like, then we're developing a framework to share this information across practitioners and, across, and building communities of practice and then we're building, um, they're implementing interventions which are built by the eight health services which are engaging with us currently or nine. So what we end up producing, we're co-creating with the stakeholders at all levels, citizens to policymakers, to ensure local ownership, focus on outcomes and equity, and continuous response to local context, and we're being systematic. We're building interventions from the lived experience of consumers or patients and the lived experience of those practitioners out there in our community who care, who see so many people born and, and die and get well and and get ill again and recover and get well. So the practitioners who really care, who really understand the families and lives of people, we're working with them to uncover the great work that they do on a daily basis. Out of this we're building a systems change, improved equity and improved health outcomes. So converting this questionnaire, here it is here, oh, oh, um, so here's a profile of an individual. They've got, uh, they're very low on this dimension, very low here. We're asking practitioners, when you see a person like this, how do you work with them to enable them to have the best chance of getting health? And my goodness, practitioners tell us. We ran this workshop in North Manchester and uh, who are these Aussies coming in with our data and, and telling us about us? Well, we're not there to tell them about how they work with them um, in, in health and and social services there. Uh, we're here to hear and listen to hear what you do. And my goodness, they told us for more than an hour that we expected it was a three and a half hour workshop was supposed to be um, just two and a half. And they just kept really sharing what they do. Great local wisdom about how to solve many problems for the most disadvantaged people in our community. Then we do ask them another tricky question. Well, we take these profiles and we write a vignette, a story about a person, and we ask the practitioners to respond to the story. We also ask the managers, you know, we can see from your data a certain number of the people in your community in fact have this profile. What services do you have out there in your organisation to ensure the needs of your people are being met? So indeed, we're generating a needs analysis and working with the best frontline practitioners to, and, and managers to come up with solutions for their organisation and across organisations. Um, so through so through the high Q of the HLQ, we're able to get enormous number of responses from wonderful practitioners about solutions across each. These are the nine dimensions of the HLQ. We're getting really thousands of strategies from healthcare professionals and managers and organisations and from um, citizens themselves of solutions to getting better care. It is a whole systems approach that we're developing. These ideas, the ground approach from the lived experience of, of um, patients are feeding into systematic guidelines about how can practitioners do things differently, to how can organisations do things differently, and then regional strategies. And this is what we're building with the Victorian government, the Victorian Health Literacy Response Framework. We can have the profile of health literacy needs, clear information, what mechanisms can we impact on, very clear strategies and interventions we can put in place at the organisational level. We get very specific interventions that are developed around priority areas around some of the particular dimensions of the HLQ which will focus on particular kinds of interventions that can be generated and evaluated. So I think this, um, and just to sum up with a couple of things, so um, another issue is what about healthcare professionals? So a number of universities around the world are now administering the HLQ to first year medical and nursing and 
and social work and other disciplines. Let's find out the health literacy competencies of students coming in, how do they change and sensitising our community of practitioners to the wide range of needs or challenges an individual have in being able to engage with the healthcare system. And then a summary slide here, I think this will be it, this one. So why is health literacy important? Well, it's the foundation, it, it is the foundations of self-care for citizens, clinicians and health workers need to know a person's capacity to process and understand health information to be able to communicate with them effectively. Policy makers need to understand the community's capacity to gain access to and understand health information to be able to set appropriate policies and provide appropriate resources. Researchers need to understand these issues to make correct judgments about research methods and their findings and to design better interventions. Indeed, interventions can be so much more carefully developed in self-care and self-management if we really understand the mechanisms that enable a person to be empowered and that seems to be what the HLQ has generated. I wonder if I can go for one more slide. So I just want to draw your attention to, um, in Europe there's a Health Literacy, the Solar Facts, um, WHO um, Solar Facts book about health literacy. We're currently writing uh, for WHO uh, Solar Facts for Health Literacy for lower middle income countries. We've already consulted with um, uh, 14 countries, 16 countries. So we're very hopeful that uh, working with health literacy we can reduce health inequalities, we can improve prevention efforts and quality of care and ultimately improve health outcomes. So I think that's probably a good place for me to end. Hi Richard, thank you very much for that. We have, I think at least two more questions, if you'll just bear with us. Richard, uh, one question on when you were um, uh, putting together the focus groups and things to, for, to develop a HLQ, what was your recruitment methodology? What sort of to ensure you had a broad range of participation across different sections of society, as it were. Yeah, yeah. we had a very, very deliberate, deliberate maximum variation, variation uh, strategy. Uh, uh, people, people who uh, were from the general, the general community, community who participated, participated in our population, population survey, survey, so they're like, uh, selected to be across um, health literacy competencies and education, and education levels. levels. And People who have just turned up in the emergency department, um, uh, and indeed uh, with no selection, a very broad range of people, and people who have taken part in self management courses already, and often of the, the Stanford type program, so they have substantial uh, competencies. Um, so that's the main, that were the three key areas, and also with expert patients uh, internationally uh, from a large organisation called OMARAC, that those workshops were running in Borneo, in Indonesia actually. And uh, one other question, are we muted or unmuted? Uh, we aren't muted. Okay. One other question, uh, okay. by, by, yeah, by Twitter was, if the HLQ as much reflects the ability of the healthcare system to respond as well as the individual's capacity in terms of health literacy. How do you in a way separate those two out in terms of the response? Well, we, we, don't, we don't really, really want, want, to want to separate them out specifically, specifically um, because we can't. Uh, what we're seeking to do is improve the responsiveness of organisations um, to ensure the organisation is more enabled. Um, and if you're undertaking a particular evaluation with, with, with clients and they have changed the literacy after your course or the intervention, uh, and whether it's because of their skill improvement, um, that's terrific. Um, some of the scales are very clearly, have very clear questions about individual skills and competencies, and other scales very strongly very particularly reflect uh, uh, the patient's lived experience of engaging with the healthcare system. So indeed, the changes in those scales don't come so much from the uh, changes in the patient's ability, but they're of their experience of engaging with um, healthcare professionals and practitioners around them. 
I think we, there's one that. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for that. There is just one other really important question, which a couple of people have asked, which is about the high Q and the HLQ. People want to know about whether or not those are free to use, and I know they're not. So, could you tell us just a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I have a strange life as an academic in that all the work I do is not owned by me, it's owned by the university. And uh, the university charges a ministry fee uh, for both these questionnaires and, uh, and that's to help cover the cost of the, the registration and providing a license to use them. Um, so the, uh, the high queue varies depending, depending on how many uh, people you're administering the the HLQ is a flat fee of, uh, I'm not too sure of the conversion rate, and I, um, it's somewhere between in pounds, um, 100 and 200 pounds uh, for a license to use it. Um, so that's, uh, and registering with um, Deakin University and going to a website, there's an application form there. We're very keen to build communities of practice and bring different groups together uh, to learn from the data. What we're seeking to do is pool very quickly large sets of data so we have benchmarks and and this is part of where these funds go to is actually to enable benchmarks to be built and to support um, PhD projects and uh, really so that um, uh, we don't sink as an academic unit who's supposed to be doing research and innovation rather than managing questionnaires. That's quite a, it is a big frustration for our university because we have extraordinary interest in this and we're not designed to um, manage this, uh, but we do still need to support people to use the questionnaire uh, validly and ensure that um, their results, uh, we can't support users very much. Um, so our, I've got um, part of our website noted here, but uh, Googling the tools, you'll be able to get linkages to us or just email me at the, uh, at the address here or check this out on Twitter or on LinkedIn. There's a whole lot on LinkedIn on both IQ and HQ. Okay. Richard, um, what, what we will do is we'll pull together all the sort of different questions and things which are outstanding and, and uh, I'll drop a line to you and we'll put together sort of a Q&A sheet to sort of mop up outstanding questions and sort of these sort of more practical points and things. Is, is that okay? That's fine. Oh, okay. Happy to do so. And just to say on behalf of everyone, thank you very much. Um, I've learned a bit more about health literacy, again, <laughs> which is uh, always good. And I know that you're not only sort of up late, but also jet lagged as well, so, or possibly <laughs> still. So, um, so on Actually, behalf of all of us in the room, uh, thank you very much. That's really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. That was so helpful. And uh, like I say, if it would be if you could let us um, have access to the slides, that would be great too. Sure, I'll send them through as a PDF you distribute as soon as you can. That's great. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Richard. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Lovely chatting. Thank you for the Sweet Bye. dreams. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, it's ten past one, so we have so we'll step into lunch. Lunch and everything is next door. Okay? Uh, in the room next door, the sandwich is left out.